Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's grace, his mercy, his peace have all been shown to you through Jesus Christ by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. High-ranking radical Islamic terrorist converts to Christianity. If that was the headline that you saw on a grocery store tabloid, if that was the headline to an e-news story that you read on the internet, or it was the subject line of an email that you received, what would your reaction be? High-ranking radical Islamist terrorist converts to Christianity. I think that there would be many people that would respond with some cynicism, maybe some skepticism, thinking to themselves, and maybe even out loud to the person sitting next to them, yeah, right, like that would ever really happen. And then if you actually read the news story and wanted to learn more about this person, and so you sat down and you started to read, and you read that this person has a well-documented, was well-known for his terrorist activities throughout his life. He was somebody that actually was willing to travel from his home country to other parts of the world for the sole purpose of carrying out terrorist plots that were targeting Christians. In fact, there's a picture, a video of this man that is standing there watching, giving his approval of the execution of a Christian. And now you're trying to tell me that just overnight, out of the blue, suddenly, this person becomes a Christian? Kind of hard for me to believe, wouldn't you say? The first century Christians might have had a similarly hard time believing the headline to Acts chapter 9. The headline to Acts chapter 9 is this, Saul's conversion. I'm pretty sure that there were a whole bunch of first century Christians who read that headline and probably responded with a little cynicism and skepticism of their own, thinking to themselves, yeah, right. As if Saul would suddenly, out of the blue, become a Christian? And I think you can probably understand their skepticism when you learn about what Saul was like. Saul was one of those men who belonged to the, Judas, to the Jewish sect called the Pharisees. He had moved up quite quickly as a young man among the Pharisees, among those people who claim that they're doing the right thing as they define the right thing, in combination with their Jewish blood, was something that made them right with God and better than anybody else. And Saul was one of those men who hated Christianity and hated Jesus and his followers. It is well documented throughout the Bible. In fact, the Bible shows us a picture of Saul standing there watching and giving his approval at the execution of a Christian by the name of Stephen. And the opening verses of Acts chapter 9 does not paint a very flattering picture of Saul. We read that Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. You see, Saul was not only concerned about the Christians living in the city of Jerusalem, which he had worked very hard to disband and scatter. But he wanted to make sure that the message of Jesus was one that was stopped anywhere that it went. He was willing to travel far from his home city of Jerusalem to go up 120 miles north to a place called Damascus. And there the Apostle Paul had one goal. To find Christians, to have them arrested, and to bring them back to Jerusalem. And Paul did not act alone. He acted under the authority of his fellow Jewish leaders who gave him letters of recommendation and approval 
that he could take to any synagogue that he traveled to, encouraging the members of that synagogue to identify any Christians around them so that Paul could have them and their families arrested and taken back to Jerusalem. Now, I'm pretty sure that a natural question to ask is, why? Why was Paul and his fellow Pharisees, why did they harbor so much hatred towards Jesus and his followers? And the answer is actually pretty simple. The message that Jesus proclaimed was one that Saul and his fellow Pharisees saw as a threat to their power. They saw Jesus' message as a threat to their way of life, to their status before the people around them. You see, these Pharisees thought that their obedience of God's law, their doing the right things as they defined the right things, in combination with the Jewish blood that flowed through their veins, was enough to make them worthy of God's love, to make them right with God. And then suddenly Jesus shows up. And Jesus begins to show these Pharisees how they had hijacked God's plan of salvation. How God's salvation was not something that the Pharisees or Saul or anybody else could earn on their own. But rather, a right standing with God was something that God would give through faith through simply trusting in God's promise to send a Savior, the Savior that now stood in front of them in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. You might remember a late-night conversation that Jesus had with a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. He went to Jesus in the middle of the night because he was afraid of his fellow Pharisees. And he went there because he was intrigued by the message that Jesus was preaching. And Jesus explained to this Pharisee, Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. When Nicodemus asked for further explanation of how this, how this spiritual rebirth takes place, that that. that results in citizenship in God's kingdom, Jesus explained to him, talking about himself, everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus went on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. A right standing before God? Citizenship in God's kingdom, eternal life, was not something that Saul or any other Pharisee or anyone for that matter could achieve on their own. For Jesus said, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, entrance into God's kingdom requires perfection that not even the best of Pharisees, nor anyone else for that matter, could achieve on their own. Rather, this right standing with God, this perfection is something that God himself would provide that Jesus would live a perfect life for all people, that Jesus would go to the cross and there pay the price for all sins, that on Easter morning Jesus would rise from the dead to prove to all that what God had promised to provide, God had provided through his son Jesus, that righteousness and perfection was something that God would give through faith, that is simply trusting relying, believing on Jesus for salvation. Sadly, there were many of those Pharisees like Saul who did not see Jesus' message as good news. Rather, they saw it as threatening. Who did Jesus think he was to show up and tell us that we're not good enough to be acceptable in God's sight? 
Plus, what would happen? What would the people think if all of a sudden these Pharisees admitted that they weren't good enough, that they actually needed God's forgiveness, that they needed Jesus for their salvation? What would the people think? They would lose their status self-appointed as the religious elite of their society. They would be like, God forbid, everyone else. They would have to admit that they could not achieve what they had claimed they were able to achieve by their good lives by so long. There was no way they were going to admit that. And so they decided that Jesus needed to die, and so did all the rest of his followers. And Saul, he was willing to do whatever it would take in order to accomplish that goal. So we find Saul leaving Jerusalem and traveling up to Damascus. And he goes there with one plan, and that is simply to identify Christians and to convince them, by whatever means, to give up their faith in Jesus. But God had a different plan. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The resurrected and living Jesus who Saul and his fellow Pharisees had thought they had finally gotten rid of, suddenly, miraculously, stands in front of Saul. And through the word of Christ, from this powerful, living, resurrected Savior, instantaneously, Saul is changed. By the work of the Holy Spirit, working through that message of Christ, Saul is immediately, miraculously changed, and he is brought to saving faith. The man who once stood in opposition to Jesus now falls on his knees in humble awe and repentance before the man he now knows as the Son of God and his Savior. The life of the Pharisee that Paul had at one time considered the power of his salvation he now realized was completely weak and incapable of providing only what God could provide in Jesus. The message that Paul had at one time worked so adamantly to silence would now be the message that Paul would be willing to sacrifice and give up at all personal cost. The message of God's grace in Christ Jesus. Saul finally did make his way to Damascus. And when he finally reached that city, he met a Christian by the name of Ananias, who was understandably a little reluctant to go and meet Saul. Saul's reputation had preceded him as a a killer of Christians and hatred of Jesus. And you can understand why Ananias may have thought, you mean to tell me, Lord, that One night, all of a sudden, out of the blue, Saul just became a Christian. But Ananias trusted the Lord. And he went and he met with Saul. And during that evening, Ananias explained the Christian faith further. And and finally, Saul decided to be baptized. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, Saul's faith was strengthened. And I guess we might say that the rest is history that Saul became the great Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christian missionaries this world has ever seen, a man who was willing to sacrifice, a man who was willing to give up nearly anything in order to proclaim the grace of God to as many people as possible, at all times giving credit where credit was due, as you and I just sang of. And the Apostle Paul would write, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Saul's conversion. It may have seemed highly unlikely, but to many first century Christians, nearly impossible. 
But is that headline really any different than any one of ours? Could not that, play, that name of Saul be replaced by your name and my name? By nature, we're no different than Saul was. The Bible tells us the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. By the sinful nature that we have inherited from our sinful parents, we by nature, we stand in opposition and rebellion to God, looking only to serve ourselves. We too do not have the ability to, to be what God requires of us to be. And sure, there is the temptation to go the way of the Pharisee, to hold up all the good things that we do for everybody else to see while trying to hide all the bad things behind us. But the reality just doesn't go away. That we too have failed to be what God demands us to be in order to be right with Him. That we have lost to laziness and apathy, not being what God asks of us as parents and friends and neighbors and even fellow Christians. But like Saul, Jesus has stepped into our lives. And with his powerful word, he has worked a miracle. For the Bible proclaims that faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. We have heard the voice of Jesus echoing in the waters of baptism and through the pages of the Bible, announcing to you, you now belong to me. What you could not be, I have been for you. My perfect life has been lived for you. And the payment of your sins is one that I have offered at the cross and now is yours. You are a citizen of my kingdom. I love you. I forgive you. I am your Savior. And by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, a miracle has taken place inside of us. As the risen and living Savior has taken you and me from power, or from weakness to power, from the inability to produce salvation by ourselves to being fully saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, from a sinful rebel, rebel to now a beloved child of God and citizen of God's kingdom both now and forevermore. And it is that love, that grace of our God that empowers you and me to go and to serve and to sacrifice for Christ that people may see us living to the glory of God and they too may experience the powerful love of our Savior God. To God be the glory for His amazing grace that has made us citizens of his kingdom and has given to us those priceless gifts of salvation. Amen.